Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Acts video. All right, today's video comes from Johnny Harris, and I knew I had to cover it because it intersects a whole bunch of things that have to do with me. One, it's history. Two, I'm very interested in Mormonism. And three, I'm a Utahn. So this should be a perfect match. All right, the original video is going to be down below. Please support Johnny Harris, and please subscribe and give this video a like if you like what you're seeing here. All right, let's get started. All right, so I know Johnny Harris is a former Mormon, and I think he's from Utah. So um, I know it's got a lot of personal history with him, so it's going to be interesting to see how he talks about this. Now, the, the title of the video is The Wild Story of How the Mormons Created Utah. So it uh, looks like we're looking into the migration and settlement of it, which is, in fact, a really interesting part of American history, religious history, Western history, all types of things. So I'm excited to check this out, and I think I, I plan on adding a lot of commentary. We'll see how long this goes today. It started with the murder of their prophet in Illinois. Back in Illinois, yeah. Joseph Smith, leader of 26,000 Mormons, father to 14 children, husband to 40 wives. The prophet, seer, and revelator was dead, and the Mormons were under attack, so they fled. They found- I don't know how much of the history you guys want me to talk about from before this video, um, but there's a long series of events that eventually led to this, but he was uh, killed by a group that killed him while he was actually in jail. And the Mormons were under attack, so they fled. They found safety in the mountains of Mexico, where they would go on to build their own utopian society. Not all of them went to Utah. Building the promised land with its own language, symbols, government, and economy. And a new prophet speaking for God, leading the church's growth, taking 56 wives of his own and continuing Joseph's vision of building Zion in the mountains. Here in the Wild West, the Mormons would go on to draw this shape as the borders for a state Desert. of their own something that would lead them into a war with the United States government, nearly destroying everything they had built. It's a conflict that helped- A lot of things I could talk about now, but he's doing an intro, certainly so. shaped these people, eventually shaping me, the stories that I heard, the culture that I grew up in, the university I attended, BYU, the way I saw the churches. world. This School. is a complicated and sensitive topic, and as always, my sources are in- Is he from Utah? I don't know if he was raised in Please Utah. Please scrutinize and critique them if you don't agree. I look forward to an interesting discussion in the comments. Okay. With that, let's dive into part two of the rise of the Mormon church. Oh yeah, he did one. I'm trying to remember if I saw it. Did he do a video on, was it like why he left the church or like the history behind the church? I can't remember. Um, If you want me to check that, I, I just have very little memory. I don't even know if I actually watched it. Maybe I just saw clips of something somewhere. If that's something you want me to check out as well, the, whatever this part one is, let me know. Um, from before, or let me know down below. Okay. Let's see where they start. Watching part one of this series will be helpful if you're unfamiliar with Joseph Smith or the establishment of the Church of Jesus okay. Christ of Latter Day Saints or the Mormon Church. I, this yeah, is part I, I'm not missing anything there. I know all about the origins, so don't worry about that. Two, and we're starting in the 1840s when the Mormons are kicked out of Illinois and Missouri and they make this thousand mile grueling journey into what was then the remote mountains of Mexico. Okay, there's a important historical event, events, I guess, happening here. So Joseph Smith, you know, it, it, the, the church was thriving there in Illinois. There was thousands of people there, built at the city called Nauvoo, um, were actually basically allowed to be there. They'd been kicked out. They'd been, uh, Joseph, Joseph had to flee out of uh, Ohio. Um, they went to Missouri. Things did not go well there politically and with the uh, the the people that already live there, they basically get kicked out by governor orders. Um, Illinois was a little bit more friendly with them. They set a set, settle a city on the Mississippi called Nauvoo, which at that time was actually bigger than Chicago. It was uh, um, a very formidable city. Anyways, I'm not going to go into all this stuff that that happens with 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 Joseph. You can look into that. Watch the other video. But anyways, when he dies, there was a secession crisis essentially. And there was these different people that all claimed that they were going to be the sort of successor, the 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 next 
prophet and leader of this group. Again, you're talking tens of thousands of people here, right? And uh, some of them split their ideas on certain things because there were multiple people that claimed, actually, there's even multiple people that claimed that Joseph had told them like personally uh, that you know, that he was, that they were going to be, you know, the, the successor. And we don't know, maybe they made that up, whatever. But um, there were some issues that divided people. One of the biggest ones that divided the group immediately was the um, stance on polygamy as well. Um, a lot of them that were uh, very much against it at that time uh, did not follow Brigham Young because Brigham Young was a very much a supporter of that. So that also divided people. Some of them are going to, uh, uh, you know, people that didn't maybe support it so much are going to stick around with, say, Sidney, R Sidney Rigdon, who was another leader in the church. There's a guy named Strang. There's a whole bunch of different people um, where the Mormons in Illinois end up kind of scattering actually all over the place. A lot of them left you know, Illinois and went to even other countries like Canada and other things like that. But yes, a branch of them, uh, you can even, a lot of them even kind of refer to it. If you're not in the mainstream Mormon church, looking at it as like the Brighamite sect. Now, one thing about Brigham Young is he was a very good organizer. He was much better with like money and things like that than Joseph Smith. And a lot of people did see him as, I think, somebody that could, uh, take care of them in a way because he's much better again, businessman and organizer that way. So, but anyways, um, a lot of them went there, but not everyone went with Brigham across to the West. Now I think he just mentioned it, but the big thing here is they're trying to leave the United States, right? This, all this stuff in the yellow here was Mexico. Um, this was out of, you know, the jurisdiction of the United States, which they were trying to get rid of or, uh, uh flee from because there had been so much persecution. Uh, Joseph Smith actually, while he died was actually, uh, campaigning to be president of the United States. Um, he had actually met with the president before. Um, but anyway, that, those are things that were going on before they go to Mexico here. Your forefathers and mine came to this country in the first place for so like one that. great reason, to escape persecution for their beliefs and to build a free country where everybody might worship God as he pleased. Yes, all of this was Mexico for a very long time. The Mormons believed and still do believe for that the -American someday War they would return to the sacred land of Jackson County, Missouri, where they would help usher in the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, but, it was believed uh, you know, by, by them that in Jackson County, uh, Missouri was where basically Armageddon is going to happen. Also, they said that's where the Garden of Eden was. For now, they would build Zion in the mountains of Mexico, far away from the American government and people, or at least so they thought. Not for long. And this is where things get really interesting to me, because right after the Mormons arrive Literally. to these mountains, they start building, and they start building fast. So yeah, 1947, they're going to be coming in there. And then interesting, all that stuff gets turned over the next year of the Mexican-American War, becomes American possessions. So they fled the America, America for like a year, and then bam, you're back in America again. They used the same designs that Joseph Smith had drawn up for the city of Zion, placing the holy temple at the center. Around this temple, they would build their city as a perfect grid. But what's most impressive to me is how well they cooperated and coordinated with each other. Yeah, and that's one thing. If you've ever traveled to Salt Lake City or any major city in Utah, you will love being able to navigate because it is, again, literally a grid system. Um, it's using numbers, not street names, which is great to navigate. Now that you have GPS, it's not as important. But um, yeah, they, they did this before they went to Salt Lake, but then here in Utah, um, they did this and it's, it's fantastic motivated they blocks, how industrious and productive they were they worked tirelessly for their vision they of did Zion. and this became oasis out of the desert of the mormon identity they ended up adopting the beehive as a metaphor for their community a group of industrious highly motivated people all working together for a common goal by the way check out the utah flag they just put on a new one last year it's actually really good. I think it's the best flag in the United States right now. But yeah, it's got a beehive on it. So that's where it comes from. According to the Mormon scriptures, the Book of Mormon, there's an ancient word for honeybee. That word is Deseret. And Deseret would soon be the name of their proposed state. And it became a foundational symbol for these people building their... I'm not going to get statehood for a long time. Now. But you see how big that is? Did you, did you people see? Building their Zion in... And it became so this would be the biggest state in the United States uh, because of this, because it would be 
I mean, it goes all the way to, to um, yeah, San Diego, but not to um, basically today's southern Mexico border and almost basically up to the Sierra Nevada. So it's like Utah, Arizona. It's got like, I guess, part of New Mexico. But yeah, Southern California, this would be huge. And the, uh, the original settlers, settlers uh, here, Mormon settlers, almost immediately spread out. Brigham Young had them spread out to this whole region here. And you can actually see the influence today because there are a lot of Mormon communities really on the fringes of all this stuff up to Idaho, to Southern California that have been there now for you know many, many decades. It became a foundational symbol for these people building their Zion in the mountains of Mexico. Okay, but they didn't just build one city next to Salt Lake. Very soon after arriving, mm -hmm. Brigham Young sent members of the church north and south to repeat the same pattern, to find an area, to build it up quickly with mm. this same grid design. There were there were Terry's that did that, that uh, went down to kind of like, sent what today would be like central Utah, uh, went down there. Putting the temple in the middle and begin developing and settling this land. In a very short time, the Mormons spread throughout this mountain west area building a network of settlement. Also a lot of Native Americans. Displacing groups. Native people in a lot of cases, sometimes yeah. peacefully with treaties, but other times with violence. It was a mixed bag I for sure. I can't emphasize enough. We'll see what he gets into, but there were some very violent things and some collaboration, but. How industrious also these some people were. They were doing things that no one else was violent doing times. in the West. They were building sophisticated ditches and canals and yeah. reservoirs, getting water into this arid land. Amazing, so that they the infrastructure. And grow. There were um, Utah is not a good place for settling. <laughs> it's not. It, it doesn't have a lot of the water sources. And again, it was desert. It, it, you know, in ancient times, yeah, the Salt Lake Valley was, was, a, was a, it was called Lake Bonneville. It was basically a, like a dried up sea. And it's not very great. It takes a, a ton of manipulation of the land to make this work. But it also, if you think about it, for settlers who originally are coming here to try to be isolated, it was perfect that way because, you know, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of people had had moved to the West across Oregon Trail, but they're going to either like Southern California. They're, you know, bypassing Utah completely, going to Northern California or going to the Pacific Northwest. You know, Utah there was kind of a nice little isolated island. Just the problem was, was how much infrastructure and, and, and things you have to do just to get things like water. Mining so metals, they were very productive, and then they would share their surplus with one another. Because in their mind, Zion was a place of one heart and one mind. There would be no poor among them. The community was more important than the individual. Honestly, when you look at even before in, in, in Utah with some of the ideas that they were going to have and, and like Kirtland and stuff, it's it was communism <laughs> they shared all their products and their wealth and their property and and all that that's really kind of how it was back then which was the complete opposite of what most settlers were thinking and doing <laughs> in the american west at the brigham time. young though Shortly was a businessman too and 1848 was not going to be the plan a victory against mexico utah never turned the u.s into gets all of this land which places the Mormons back inside the borders of the United States. But still, the government didn't have a lot of control out here. This was still the Wild West. Most people coming out here were white settlers in search of a new life, pursuing their dreams um, of Now freedom. also understand too, this was also the gold rush. Um, the gold rush. So there's a huge movement of there. Literally, you know, um, the uh, within two years of the first Mormon settling there, the gold rush happens. So a lot of people moving in and into Utah too to try to look for mining opportunities. So they got that buried right on top of them. So right within a couple of years, you know, their their isolation did not last long. Became part of the United States, and then with another year, the gold rush of abundant land of riches and gold out in the wild west. And right in the middle of all of this, Utah wasn't the greatest for gold though. Of industrious Mormons, driven by obedience and sacrifice and a commitment to communal living, preparing for the end of the world, for the millennium. This is a tension that will blow up in just a second. You know, living first, thing wasn't nearly as big as before about Utah, how though. popular the Mormon Zion was becoming. It was pretty good for outside investors. Brigham and stuff Young too. had sent missionaries all over, but especially to Europe, 
to the yeah. west coast of England specifically. Yeah, where... they, they needed a big influx at this time of new people. They had been targeting, though, Europe before this as well. Uh, Brigham Young um, earlier, but before, you know, in Utah had, had been one of those people too. So remember, this is all within the Industrial Revolution as well. And the United States was seen as this land of opportunity. So a lot of these people came over. And yeah, you know, they're out there preaching about Joseph Smith, Book of Mormon and stuff. But a lot of it was also about economic opportunities in the American West. And for a lot of people in Europe, that sounded very, very intriguing for them uh, to get there. So that was a big motivation for um, a lot of these people moving to the United States and basically become part of the, the Mormon community out West. These missionaries would preach the word of the restoration of the gospel and the building of Zion in the American West. And it really was effective. When I was a Mormon missionary in Mexico, we would hear stories about these Mormon missionaries out in England who were doing this initial missionary yeah. work. And honestly, these guys were like legends to us. They were <laughs> so successful. The Mormons back in Salt Lake would pool right. their money together. Again, because you can tie so much economic opportunity on top of the religious talk. Again, this is, the, this is a huge era of, um, for context here, of American immigration, the mid 1800s. It was huge. A lot of people are coming to the United States anyways. And help pay for the way of these new converts. Yes, and they would help them the ocean, pay. Across the continent to come join them. That was the build. biggest barrier for My great, migrants. great, great grandmother and grandfather were some of these converts from Wales. They were converted by a missionary in Wales and then made the grueling trek with their children, eventually ending up north of Salt Lake City. Yeah, it sucked to make that trip. they contributed to building Zion. So a lot of people died me, on those trips. And a lot of people who grew up with pioneer heritage, as we call it in the church. These stories of sacrifice become a foundational part of our belief in our yeah. faith. Why else would our ancestors have sacrificed so much to build this church? You know, the movement of, of them out west too, definitely, I, I would I would think too, divided the lukewarm, maybe I guess what you call like lukewarm earlier Mormons, especially the ones that bought into but into um, Brigham Young as their leader. And again, remember, many didn't. The ones that are going to come over are obviously going to be very, very devout. So this community is going to be very, very devout because who's going to go through all this hardship of crossing the plains, which is deadly in itself, to a place that needed all of this work just to be able to survive? You could see how they're, you know, <laughs> going to going to be very devout people. So. Brigham Young's Society of Worker Bees started to become more than just a religious community in the mountains. And he's in the hand, his hands are in everything. More like a theocratic society with yeah. the prophet as the head of their government. They had schools, they had newspapers. Their network of settlements created a complex economy that was run by the church who directed everything, where to build, what to build. Soon they had their own currency. Yeah. This is where put aside the religious stuff and you know Brigham's known so much for the polygamy and whatever other doctrines like you know religious things but as somebody as like a like an organizer and uh, again somebody to be in charge like a, a CEO or something was pretty incredible at the job, like really was. What they did was very, very smart, even to down to things, not just, you know, about getting people spread out and selling them to, you know, build infrastructure and all that. But yeah, you had the grid systems and all but even like setting up the counties and you set up the counties geographically based on basically watershed so you wouldn't have issues with water rights. And it was, it was pretty ingenious as a leader. That's why he was like the, you know, you had like, like Joseph early on, um, needed somebody like that the the the, the good businessman that makes sense he could be the ideas man and yeah then uh he does that but then uh, you know after after joseph's out of the picture um you know Br brigham also becomes the religious ideas man too but added to that all these other skills he had as a as a governor and we'll see if he gets to that but he literally becomes the governor of of the territory of utah they made these really unique coins, some featuring their unique symbols, handshakes, and a reminder that union is strength. Or here we see the beehive again, and a reminder to do your duty. They're building sugar coins. mills and processing iron me and building have factories. One. And they even <laughs> invented their own writing system. This was stupid like though, this was dumb. Which was meant to unify the people around a common way to spell and pronounce words. Why? <laughs> I actually have a reprint here of the Deseret. Oh, that's alphabet. cool. They never taught us how to read this, which I'm kind of that's pointless. Like, what's the why? Love to know what this all says. Why? 
But there was a big problem for the Mormons, which is that this was all now the United States, and the federal government was yeah. exerting more and more control west. Now, and remember, too, though, the, the federal government at this time does not have a lot of power, really did not have a lot of power. So territories and states, like whoever was, whether it was a territory or state, like a governor of a state or a territory, had the most power over a place than anyone else. They were like their own kings or, uh, you know, in elected ways, their own uh, presidents. So they had so much control very far away of the United States. And U.S. could think of that as a good thing, but they could see it as a bad thing. It depends on what they think of these people. More and more people settled out there. Once again, this could be the end of the Mormons' vision of Zion. So they acted very quickly. Especially if it's going to be theocratic and to open, openly. to state of their own. Telling the government that, hey, we know you didn't like us settling in Missouri or Illinois, but we're out here in the West and we've settled and developed all of this land in a really short time. Very Please successfully. Have our own state so that we can practice our religion as we please. And what is the state that they proposed? This Giant. massive so shape. That's what we said. Take a moment to soak it's this way in. Too Look at where we are here. These now, it's the so much of it's unsettled. There's Native American groups there as far as settling infrastructure. This is a big, vast wasteland. The proposed Mormon state encompass parts of modern day Arizona, Southern California, yes, even Southern Colorado, California. Idaho, New Mexico, Oregon, Wyoming, and Utah. This thing is huge. If it had become a state, the modern United States would look something like this. Bigger than it's Washington, like Oregon, the and California combined. And they would call it the state of Deseret. They were serious. They drafted a constitution and they lobbied hard for their state. And the US government said, absolutely not. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. The government didn't love that the Mormons were building this theocratic society that was completely yeah. independent from the United States. And then a lot of the peculiar things, there was a lot of things they did not like about the culture. You know, some of it that got them in problems back in Missouri was voting in these giant blocks. Um, that was a part of it too. Going into certain lands that other people had already kind of been in. Um, the government also did not like that the United or that the um, Mormons back in again places like Missouri were openly proselyting uh, to Native American um, groups because there were laws and things passed to try to protect them. That way, they did not like that uh, proselytizing. But then some of the beliefs, and uh, hopefully it gets to the elephant in the room here, which uh, one of the biggest dividing things between the, the, the Mormons and their statehood and the U.S. government is going to be their practice of polygamy, which was, especially in the 1800s, seen um, by people as repugnant across but the United States. They did kind of like how industrious the Mormons were, how effective they were. It was at great economically land, for the U.S. Displacing the natives and building up communities for white people. This is something the United States was doing at the time. It was their manifest, manifest destiny. Yeah, they're literally the doing were it. really good at it. So, Literal manifest destiny. In order destiny. to keep the Mormons productively settling the land that they had just won from Mexico, the federal government does grant them this territory. Utah territory. Not as big as the state of Deseret, but still a nice big territory. And they let Brigham Young, the prophet of the church, be the first governor. Now, the U.S. Congress did not want to name this after a word from the Book of Mormon that means beehive. <laughs> name it so after the Ute Utah, tribe. Yeah. After the local Ute natives who this land had been taken from. Little fun side note here, the Washington Monument here in Washington, D.C. was built using stones from every state and territory. And as this negotiation was going down, the stone that made it into the Washington Monument says Deseret, not Utah. Yep. It's got the beehive and a big eye that says holiness to the Lord, like the most Mormon symbol you could ever have <laughs> right here in the Washington Monument. <laughs> So the Mormons now have a territory called Utah Territory. It's not a state yet. President Brigham Young is their governor and their prophet, and they can continue to build Zion in peace. But the government now sort of has an eye on them. They send in some federal employees to like keep an eye on the Mormons, make sure they don't get too revolutionary with their theocratic government and their apocalyptic ideas. Yeah. They're once again back on that the- That was one of the things that upset a lot of people back in the Midwest when they were, as they were talking about all of that stuff that like, you know, this is going to be the site of Armageddon and it's going to be a new Jerusalem. And these, these other phrases, these very big phrases, religiously uh, inspired phrases and, and goals in these places of Missouri. And the locals were like, uh, no, <laughs> and it rubbed the, <laughs> rubbed them a lot, uh, the wrong way to add to all the political issues that they believe the Mormons brought in as well. 
defense radar. The government's like, they better start behaving like Americans. They need to quit it with the whole, we're making our own government and society for the coming of Jesus thing, or things are gonna get messy. This means potential theocracy, right? And now we have to talk about is, polygamy. Some ah, here it of you is. have been waiting the whole time to hear me talk about polygamy. Well, <laughs> here it goes. You'll remember from part one that when Joseph Smith was the leader of the church, he came out and said that the Lord had commanded him to take multiple wives, mm -hmm. that this was a part of the new and everlasting Penny Alger story you'll hear about, probably hear about her. So that, that stuff that he's saying about, you know, God, you know, saying that he had done that, um, that a lot of that, that wasn't really like, put out publicly until after he had um, had these relations uh, with these people. The Fanny Alger girl, she was a, um, a girl that worked in the the, the Smith household and um, Joseph's wife, Emma, had, had had caught them together and it became this big issue. And then after that, you'll hear about the this, you know, proclamation about you know commanding polygamy. The law of marriage there was some for Mormons. Post -hoc Joseph ended up marrying around rationale. 40 women in his lifetime, some of them very young. But polygamy wasn't for everyone at first. Also, some of them were men or uh, people that were already married to people. You know how he was saying that there are, uh, they were they sent missionaries, you know, out to out to Europe. Some of the people that uh, are some of the women that he got married to were the wives of some of those missionaries who went over to Europe. And when they came back there, they were like, wait, what? Joseph invited a few select church leaders and people in his circle to participate in polygamy. And they continued doing that. Behind Brigham closed Young doors. also did this, but in kind of a hush-hush way for yeah. a bit. That is until 1852. Yeah, you had to be really in the inner circle at that early polygamy time um, to really uh, like be a part of it. It was, a, it was a, yeah, an inner circle. Very few of them actually had multiple wives even the mormons that did come across um uh, uh you know with with uh brigham young to to the west weren't necessarily polygamists themselves may have been okay with the, okay with the doctrine but a majority of people did not have polygamous marriages a couple and the ones that did it was usually like one was created you know. prophet brigham young stands at the pulpit of this very beautiful building and tells the members of the church that this artwork plural cool. marriage or polygamy is a divine law from god a superior way of life He's elevating it even higher. And in this conference, he cites Joseph Smith's revelation on marriage, saying that marriage, including plural marriage or polygamy, is the only way to be exalted, which is the Mormon way of saying to become a god, which is the ultimate goal in Mormon doctrine. Basically the highest tier of salvation, saying you had to, to do that. And the more, I think, maybe, I don't know, Remember, though, if you said, like, the more wives you have, the closer you can get to that, too. But it was still very much uh, not a lot of people could do that. I mean, affording such a big family like that, you know, to have something like like a, a Brigham size with, you know, the dozens and dozens of wives would be unachievable for most Mormons. The thinking was that plural marriage would allow more worthy women to marry a worthy man and have the opportunity to be exalted. Brigham Young went on to marry like a win -win, six wives. He had kids with 16 of them, 57 they children. A lot total. of kids. Some of there are a lot of Youngs, people with the last name Young in Utah. You can see why <laughs> the family tree. Yeah, look at that, young and old. These wives were older widows that Brigham said he married just to take care of them. And some of them were 13 years old. Children. So now that the prophet had openly endorsed yep. it, it was public. This was out. More and more Mormon men began practicing. Old polygamy, photos are so creepy. Mostly younger women as their extra wives. If you want to look at this graph, pause the video or go look at my sources because it's pretty interesting. Yeah. But let's move on. So unsurprisingly, the government does not like this. Some lawmakers in Washington, D.C. see polygamy as the equivalent That's of right. slavery. Republican Something Party absolutely opposed it. And it's why, like, <laughs> Lincoln was, was supportive of this. And um, yeah, the two relics of barbarism for the Republican Party, polygamy and slavery. Uh, two things practiced in Utah. Utah Territory allowed slavery until it was nationally abolished. It was a slave territory, technically speaking. Thing that at the time was there were a slaves debate in the country. In, uh, so Utah. It was about to turn into a civil Not war. Not a ton. But and as the government exerts more and more control out here in the West, a few dozen. they become less and less comfortable with the Mormons building their own theocratic utopia communal society within the borders of the United States. And Brigham Young, the governor and prophet, is not helping the situation. And by the way, you know how we were talking about, and if you didn't know about 
about Joseph Smith running for Congress, his whole thing was to be a lot more like libertarian. It was like, hey, keep the government out of your business. We want religious freedom. We want these other freedoms. That was going to be his campaign ticket, campaign platform. Uh, you know, have if he was able to like fully get into to to the race. He he died not too long after he um, had proposed this, but he was thinking that he could really appeal to a lot of Americans, you know, saying to get the government basically out of your business, which again is interesting because the size and, and scope of the government back then was minuscule compared to what it is now. So they were like, like a, basically like libertarian for that time period, you know. Writing to his followers that the world is quote, on the eve of revolution, giving speeches to his lawmakers in Utah territory, saying that quote, the government is going to pieces and that when the time comes, we, shall be called the kingdom of God. Well, like the church it's 1850s. is the real government. That's so what everybody was saying. We're on the eve of, of the civil war. Or a brewing revolution by an apocalyptic religious group. Add to this that more and more Americans are hearing about polygamy and are disgusted. You can see this in this waterfall of political cartoons. Love old political cartoons. Brigham Young man. at home with all of his wives. Oh, gosh. All the wives fighting in bed <laughs> while the babies cry. An elder's happy home. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is kind of snarky and fun or whatever, but you also see some more violent oh my gosh. depictions. The tentacles, like they Sam love that stuff then. Marching with his sword into Utah, the Mormon vermin oh, Uncle Sam. or lines of women marching into a skull labeled Dang. Utah. The media starts portraying- Ooh, Mormon. Mountain Meadow? Is this after Mountain Meadow's massacre? I don't know if he gets into that at all here. Um, it was a, um, an incident where Mormons in Southern Utah had attacked a traveling caravan that they thought had people involved with Joseph Smith's uh, murder, which was not the case. And they slaughtered like a hundred of them. Men marching into a skull labeled. Utah. There's a big debate about if um, Brigham Young had kind of ordered it. He kind of got his hands washed clean of it. And uh, the this guy, Lee, who had actually conducted it, uh, got the death penalty for it but uh yeah brigham young it's, it's 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 very debatable about what his knowledge level was to that but the media starts portraying mormons as a different race less white than other americans was there a thing about mormons, the mormons with horns don't wasn't that a thing polygamy it's a law of god like it's very black and white their prophet has said so and in fact they kind of double down mormon leaders start defending polygamy saying that it's a healthier way of life Monogamy makes a man dry up and wither. The man with lots of wives looks fresh and young and sprightly. Why? Because God loves that man. He received Kimball. He had a bunch. One. Polygamy promotes life, purity, Joseph's innocence, man. vitality, and health. Monogamy engenders disease, disappointment, and premature death. Wow. These are some bold claims. By the way, uh, the um, Joseph's wife, main wife, Emma, you know, kind of got her feet held to the fire about having to kind of begrudgingly accept polygamy she was never very happy about it but um she stayed behind uh, she stayed behind as well as um children eventually and there's another branch of the church that goes through the uh that stayed back before you know didn't go to utah that another branch of the church that keeps going through that lineage of joseph's family the federal government has had enough they see this as an open rebellion happening within their borders. And that's when they call in the troops. Utah war. Yeah. War is coming to Utah. And Brigham Young prepares his men, calls them back from their missions, rallies his militia to fight back against the federal government that wants to end their Zion. Now, the Mormon militia, called the Nauvoo Legion, is not going to win against the United States Army. Now, the army had, getting, had been bigger, but... Back in the the Nauvoo Legion, back in um, back when they were actually in Illinois, was huge. It was one of the biggest military forces, basically comparable to the United States military, because there wasn't a large standing military in the early day. Like you're talking 1830s, 40s um, at that time, and it's going to grow obviously as we get closer to the, the Civil War. But it used to be this legion comparable to any military group in the U.S. That freaked out so a lot of people. And he operate his own tactics. army. They start kind of 
terrorizing the supply lines, burning stuff. They create these cattle stampedes. They block canyons, anything to slow the federal troops down. At one point in the middle of all of this, a group of the Mormon militia happen upon a group of settlers who are traveling to California. They have a standoff. Here it is, Eventually, yeah. the Mormons end up tricking them the into massacre. coming out and giving them their guns, at which point they go on to massacre almost the entire group, 120 men, women, and children. Only a handful of children were spared, and they were the ones who were too young to remember what was happening. But despite this increased tension... Okay, so you didn't say a little bit more about Mount Meadows, too. They had also organized it, tried to organize it along with um, the Native Americans that were there. And the kind of bad parts of this, the, the very nefarious part about this, too, was that when they actually were going to set this up. So they had word that this big party was going to be traveling through Southern Utah. And again, the rumor going around was that there may have been people there that were responsible for Joseph Smith's uh, death years before. Anyway. So when they uh, got it, they, they did this alongside with um, native American group and the, the, the Mormons showed up to it dressed up as native Americans and the Native Americans are like, what are you guys doing here? Like, what do you have planned here? And the, and the group was not, uh, the Native American group wasn't necessarily aware about how, like, bloody this was going to be, like, planning to be. But anyway, it was likely, it was chosen that why they dressed up like Native Americans to basically be able to deflect and say it was Native Americans that had killed these people and not necessarily these Mormons, if news ever got out. But it ended up being successful in the fact that they killed basically everyone but the very small children, who I think ended up getting adopted into some of those families. But that's called the Mountain Meadows Massacre. You can look into it. It's a, a very interesting part of Western history. This event known as the Utah War never escalates into a full-blown battle between the army and the Mormon militia. There's bigger fish Brigham to fry Young in the U.S. Ends up backing down. The Mormons negotiated with the government, saying that they would allow the army to come into Utah to keep an eye on things. Brigham Young also had to step down, and the government would be replaced with more non-Mormons. Yeah. So there was a ton of troops. Uh, he was governor. He was you know, as the leader of the group, obviously he was going to be governor. But again, U.S. did not like that essentially a theocracy was there. Theocracy is when your government leaders are also your religious leaders. Now, remember, in, in, in you know, uh, Mormon beliefs, the prophet is a spokesperson for God and said to communicate with God. You know, he's, he's uh, more than just some political leader. He's, you know, the prophet. It's in Utah at this time, it's the 1860s, and the Civil War breaks out over in the East. And at that moment, the largest group of federal troops are stationed in Utah, <laughs> keeping an eye on the Mormons. So far away. But even still, under all of this scrutiny, people keep coming. The Mormon communities keep growing. Mormon men continue to take multiple wives. The government and feels like coming they're in. being ignored. So back in Washington, D.C., Lawmakers decide it's time to end the Mormon project once and for all. Mm -hmm. And this time, they're going to do it with laws. Yep. They pass a series of laws that make polygamy or anything like it illegal. Yep. The Mor now remember, the Utah, uh, Utah for now decades <laughs> is going to be clamoring for statehood. And that was uh, one of the last things that they the, the, uh, the government was saying that you're going to have to get rid of if you want statehood. Plus, they're making it already illegal nationally. But it, uh, I'll let him talk about it because it was still being polygamy was still being practiced, not even after this law, but even after the church is eventually going to say they're going to ban it. It was actually still being practiced. Secret. Mormons are now officially breaking the law and thousands are rounded up yeah. and put in jail. And crucially, this law also gives the government power to seize the church's property, like their funds, their buildings, including their precious temples, mm. the most important place in Mormonism. The government could argue, and the Supreme Court would agree, that these temples where Mormons get married were being used to break the law because they were being used to marry men to multiple women which was being able to control those temples was seen as a major deal because there are things that go on in the temple that is believed to ensure your uh your your exaltation in heaven so to go to heaven you have to be able to do certain things that are in the temple so like you know the the mormons see that if if that stuff gets seized as literally literally damaging to their eternal existence 
is now a felony under the law. Temples were the final straw for this community. It represented what could be the end of their church. So the prophet at the time, Wilford Woodruff, comes out and says that the Lord has showed him a vision of what will happen if they don't give up practicing polygamy. He said that their holy temples would be taken away. Their men, including their top leaders, would all be thrown into jail and it would be the end of the church. He practiced I mean, he wasn't it as well. seeing the future here. This was already happening, and this was logically the next step for the church. Yeah. So he commands the members to stop. Many members of the church listened, and many totally ignored it and continued to practice plural marriage for decades. So you can see why, because a lot of people thought that the, the prophet here, Woodruff, was doing this purely for political reasons when it was said that this was supposed to be something that God told the people to practice. It's like, what are you saying? That the government can can change the will of God. So again, some of them, you know, some of the the the, the people will will stop practicing it, but a lot of them kept doing it by basically saying, ah, you know, maybe Woodruff's just kidding. You know what I mean? It's just it's just a show to to convince the government that it's not actually going to be pra or practiced anymore. So we'll just like keep doing it. Now this also branched off a lot of people. Now, you, you may have heard of, or had stereotypes or whatever about Mormons practicing polygamy today, and there are, but not in the mainstream Mormon church. And a lot of their uh, their their break off, which you know, they're going to break off from the church, was based upon this, basically saying that w uh, Woodruff, you know, w uh, the President Woodruff, um, he did not he wasn't speaking for God, that God never came down and said they shouldn't practice polygamy. So they kept doing it and found loopholes around to get it. So, yeah, there's a lot of these other they call them like fundamentalist, you know, churches or other sects that that that, again, practice polygamy today. But again, they believe all the stuff about the Mormon church basically up to that point. So believe in Joseph Smith and and that and Brigham Young. But at this point, this is the fork in the road that they believe that the mainstream church today is not actually the authority anymore. And this is that 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 fork. This includes seven of the top leaders called apostles who continued to practice polygamy even after the manifesto. The church did come out a few years later and said, no, really, you have to stop or we will excommunicate you. Because they kept doing it. Even I think even Woodruff was still practicing. They were still like marrying off people, mar like doing plural marriages. They, was, they were still doing it, uh, you know, under, you know, supposed to be off the record. But the, I think the government found out that, no, they were they were still practicing it and put more pressure again back on the church. So like, no, like this is it. Like you guys need to actually do it. And then there's like a, a hard line, like they call it the, what's it called? The second revelation. It was like the first one, they're like, hey, stop doing it. And then the second one, a few years later, it was like, no, really, we actually have to stop doing this. Otherwise we're gonna lose our whole, you know, community. And even still some disagreed, leading to a yeah. group of them to gather in a small desert community in Arizona where yeah. they continued to practice polygamy which they were told was Warren a Jeffs, ever heard of him? I wonder if he's going to talk about that. They became the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Might have heard of him. FLDS, yeah, there he is. Where today they remain, where 30,000 members live in these insular communities. Um, this guy right here, right here, his name is Warren Jeffs. He, he had a father, or ruler, I forget what it was. Um, they were, again, one of those groups that's like, no, we need to keep doing it. This guy is going to be is, is serving prison. He'll be serving prison for the rest of his life because um, he was marrying and um, all kinds of evidence of, of sexual abuse with children. Basically, they were they're also trafficking them. A big thing they said is they you know, they raided their their temple down there, and in their temple, you know, there were basically beds where these marriages, these forced, you know, teen marriages to again old men like him, um, were being consummated. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, he's serving a life in prison. But there's still people devout to him. Interestingly, he's in prison right now. He's still leading that branch of that church. You know, technically from prison, uh, from a prison cell. But I did see um, also that some people did leave at this point and you know, left him at that point and kind of maybe the trance or whatever he had over them broke, but there's still people devoted to this guy. And yeah, he's today. They remain where 30,000 members bars, live in these insular communities, continuing the practice of polygamy. That is a whole other rabbit hole for another yeah. day. Mainstream Mormons did eventually get totally on board. There's great, by the way, absolutely great YouTube documentaries that go down there and we'll talk to those people and both people in the group and out of the group. Pete, Peter, uh, 
what's his name? Santanello or whatever, or the, the kind of bald guy. He did a really good one down there recently, about, probably about a year or two years ago, maybe. Penny kind of significant. I forgot his name, but he's and great. Utah was eventually made a state. Today, the descendants of those original pioneers live in Mormon communities along this corridor that Brigham Young settled. My wife and I went to school right here in the heart of it, in this beautiful valley surrounded by these massive mountains. Feeling close to the Very specific beautiful area. sugar-coated version of this history the that Wasatch I was front there. These stories of struggle and conflict, sacrifice in the name of your beliefs, bravery in the face of persecution, a work ethic and a discipline and an obedience that I was shaped by. A huge part of my identity and the identity of a lot of LDS people. But what I've learned is that that identity is deeply linked to exploitation and apocalyptic thinking. Exploitation of Mormon From the women beginning and it was. children. The theft of native land. Obedience to a god whose will is strangely aligned with the incentives of men. This a belief we get. that the world will end any day, which justifies all of this. His ideas. A confirmation that we were the chosen people, the real Israel, called of God to prepare the world for the end to gather the tribes before the Savior's return. I still don't fully understand how I could find such meaning and beauty in something that I now find to be so wrong, to be so damaging. Mm. And yet there's a third and final part. He's, he's very much come out against that stuff. You can tell, at least the things, the times I have heard him talk about his you know, Mormon history, He's he, he does avoid, it seems to avoid a lot of the harshest words I think that he may want to say just in the, for the sense of he doesn't want to, you know, upset a lot of people, maybe, maybe his family members, he doesn't want to come off as critical, but you know, he, he, it's like he wants to be, but he, he doesn't, you know, to this story that you have to understand. If you want to understand the Mormon experience, I'll eventually be making a third video where I explain be about. a bizarre pivot that happens where the Mormons go from being a rebellious apocalyptic group in the mountains fighting with the federal government like the mormon reformation sort of racing it growing the church into a global organization who has used that same beehive cooperative work ethic to become wealthy and powerful wielding over a hundred million dollars in financial assets the financial the controversies building zion in preparation for the end of the world it's the same goal that motivated joseph smith to start the church the same goal that kept the saints going with brigham young and building out the mountain west and it is the same goal that motivates members of the church today. Okay. Final thoughts. All right, thanks for sticking with me uh, this long into this video. I think not much more I need to say. I said a lot during the video, but uh, good job by Johnny, you know, hitting a lot of these things. I hope, I hope I was able to add a lot more. It's something, if, you, if you're not re really know about Mormon history, it really is a fascinating part of American history. I know some of you come to my channel and come to history channels about American history. Really look into it because the, the history of Mormonism and Mormons is completely intertwined with the history of the United States and especially with the expansion of the United States. It's completely intertwined and it's really fascinating the more you get into it and for all the aspects of it, the theology, the politics. Anyways, thanks again for being here. If you like this video, please give it a thumb up. Let me know if you want me to cover some more stuff similar to this and we'll see you next time. Bye.